Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Harish, an ENT surgeon. So in the last uh, presentation, we discussed about, we were discussing otosclerosis and uh, we discussed about uh, the relevant anatomy, the pathogenesis and the etiology of otosclerosis. Today, let us discuss about the types of otosclerosis. Okay, the types of otosclerosis. Um, uh, basically, what are we going to discuss? Basically, types of otosclerosis. We are going to discuss the pathology of otosclerosis, the sign, the symptoms, the symptoms of otosclerosis and the signs of otosclerosis. So, both the symptoms and signs together, we uh, group it and make it into clinical features, okay? Signs and symptoms together form what is called clinical features. Okay, coming to the types of otosclerosis, basically there are three types of otosclerosis. One is the stapedial otosclerosis. Second one is the, called the cochlear otosclerosis. Third one is called the histologic otosclerosis. Now, coming to stapedial otosclerosis, basically when we talk about uh, otosclerosis, we are talking about stapedial otosclerosis. It is the most common variety where you have the otosclerotic focus that happens around the foot plate area, around the foot plate area, stapes foot plate area, and uh, anterior or posterior or around the stapes foot plate area. This causes stapes to get fixed. Stapes fixation, that's what is written here, causes stapes fixation and finally causes conductive hearing loss. This is what we talk about when we say otosclerosis. We are by default talking about stapedial otosclerosis only. So the first one, the first type is the stapedial otosclerosis, which is causing stapes fixation and conductive hearing loss. It is the most common variety. Now, the types of uh, uh, stapedial otosclerosis based on where the otosclerotic focus has started, we are dividing it or there are five types of stapedial otosclerosis. One is the anterior type of stapedial otosclerosis. Here, the otospongiotic focus or the formation of the newborn is happening anterior to the stapes anterior to the stapes or the oval window. So this is what we are talking about, the anterior focus. So this is the most common variety. This is the most common variety. Now, sometimes there can be also posterior focus where the uh, where the autospongiotic newborn formation starts in the posterior part of the oval window. That is called the fistula, fistula, post fenestrum, post fenestrum, fenestrum means oval window. Okay. So it is starting posterior to the oval window. Okay, sometimes it can be circumferential where you will have the autospongiotic bone around the oval window. This is called the circumferential type of stapedial otosclerosis. You can have the biscuit type of otosclerosis where they, there is, uh, this is suppose this is the oval window and uh, there is a autospongiotic bone formation which is there on top of the uh, 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 stapes uh, foot plate and this uh, the annular ligament which is connecting the stapes foot plate to the oval window is paired. This is paired. So this is the biscuit type of stapedial otosclerosis. You can also have the obliterative type of otosclerosis where it is like circumferential plus biscuit type you become obliterative right. The entire the annulus is involved, the stapes foot plate is involved, everything is involved in this otospongiotic bone, newborn formation forming the obliterative type. So first one is the anterior which is the most common. You can have it posterior in the fistula, posterior post fenestrum. You can have circumferential type circumferential type you can have the biscuit type and you can have the obliterative type these are the five types of uh, stapedial otosclerosis coming to cochlear otosclerosis cochlear otosclerosis is defined now this is important is defined as sensory neural have uh, hearing loss in the absence of stapes fixation so when we say otosclerosis we are basically thinking of it as stapes fixation but here there is no stapes fixation there is no stapes fixation at all in the absence of stapes fixation so the patient is going to present to you with sensorineural hearing loss the patient is present to you with sensorineural hearing loss 
this involves other areas of the otic capsules like the round window region so uh, now there is a clinical picture in which a patient presents to you whatever age maybe 30 or maybe in the early 20s and 30s a female only patient who presents to you it has increased after pregnancy patient on you on doing this uh, tuning folk test you find out that the patient is having sensory neural hearing loss pure tone audiometry also confirms that the patient is having sensory neural hearing loss tympanic membrane is normal tympanometry that is the impedance audiometry is normal then the then how do you know that the patient is having stapedial cochlear otosclerosis only when you do a CT scan you can find out or you can do an exploratory exploratory tympanotomy where you want to see what is inside the middle here you uh, give an incision in the external artery canal and elevate the tympanometal flap then you find that there is an otosclerotic focus around the oval window region around the oval window region then you th then you put the diagnosis of cochlear otosclerosis this is a rare diagnosis but this is one of the types of otosclerosis which you should be aware of now what is sensory how does the sensory neural hearing loss happen because of the liberation of toxic materials into the inner ear fluid we have already talked there is also there is a process of bone resorption and bone formation continuously happening there is proteolytic enzymes which are which are being produced and all these can go into the inner ear fluid causing sensory neural hearing loss so that is the way you will get cochlear otosclerosis coming to the third variety that is the histologic otosclerosis histologic otosclerosis means uh, there is otosclerosis somewhere on the otic capsule, on the bony labyrinth, it can be in the semicircular canals, it can be in the labyrinth, it can be in the vestibule or the labyrinth and it can be in the cochlea also, where, wherever there is the, this encontral bone <coughs> of the uh, bony labyrinth, you can have otosclerosis, but the, the patient does not present, the patient does not have any symptoms, the patient will not come to you, only on a post-mortem examination or you are examining the, uh, you are doing surgery for some other reason and you find that there is some cochlear otosclerosis, some otosclerosis on the bony labyrinth, but it is not causing any symptoms. So there is no sensory neural hearing loss. Pathology. Uh, pathology means you can, there is a, one is a gross pathology, the other is a microscopic pathology. So what does it appear like uh, grossly, uh, the tympanosclerotic focus, sorry, the autosclerotic focus. After raising the tympanometal flap, you, this is the tympanometal flap. The, the, this is what is written, right? Meatal skin and eargram reflected. This is called the tympanometal flap. Exploring, uh, exposing the autosclerotic middle ear. So, uh, this is the, uh, what you see this one, this is the long process of the incus, this is the stapedial tendon, this is the stapedial tendon and uh, this is the anterior crura, posterior crura and you can see the chalky white grayish uh, new bone formation or the spongy bone formation, new spongy bone formation can be seen here, okay. So, this is how a gross pathology or when you look at it, it appears chalky white, grayish or yellow, okay, active lesions where it is, uh, where the, there is still the bone is being formed, then it appears red in color because of increased vascularity, we have already talked about this, okay, because of increased vascularity, so this is how the gross, uh, grossly the autosclerotic appear, uh, autosclerotic focus appears. Coming to the microscopic uh, features of uh, autosclerosis, you can have either an immature active lesion, how does an immature active lesion appear on microscopy and how does a mature lesion appear on microscopy. Uh, immature active lesion, what do you mean by immature active lesion? Here uh, the old bone, that is the hard bone is being resorbed and resorbed, is being resorbed and new bone formation is happening. New bone formation means what? New vessels are there, increased vessels will come here and marrow spaces are increased, marrow spaces are increased because we are trying to form new bone formation and there is a lot of osteoblastic activity, osteoblastic activity is increased. So what happens? So increased cementum type substance is being laid down. This cementum like substance appears blue on HP, hematoxylin, yes, and stain. This cementum, the increased quantity of cementum that you see on HP examination is appearing like, is, is appearing blue on hematoxylin, yes, and stain. That is called blue mantles. So here, this all this bluish color that you can see, these are the cementum. It is being uh, put by the 
that is being put by the osteoblast so that the new bone formation can happen. This is called blue mantles. So don't get confused. Blue mantles is a microscopic feature of otosclerosis where there is immature, immature active lesions which are laying down cementum like substance. Okay. Coming to mature lesion, all that activity is gone. Like newborn formation is almost done. The vessels have gone back. The marrow spaces have reduced. Cementum is not there. So there is firm bone now. More bone is there than cement. This more bone appears red in color. So uh, mature lesion appears red in color. Whereas the immature lesion, active lesion appears blue in color. That blue uh, is called, that blue. Uh, the description is called blue mantles. Okay, in microscopic examination. So types of otosclerosis and uh, pathology of otosclerosis is not an important question, but we covered it because uh, uh, this completes the entire chapter. Coming to symptoms, symptoms of otosclerosis. Now we already know what is the pathogenesis of otosclerosis. There is immature cartilage cell rests. Okay, those uh, get activated because of various factors like because of genetic factors, because of uh, hormonal factors, because of viral infection with measles, because of immunologic autoimmune conditions, uh, because of antibodies to type 2, uh, type 2 collagen, because of trauma, because of various factors, these immature cell rests have got activated and the new spongy bone starts formation, there is formation of new spongy bone new spongy bone starts forming. So that one, because that is present most commonly in the fistula ante fenestrum area, it grows onto the stapes and it causes stapes to get fixed, causing what kind of hearing loss? Conductive type of hearing loss. Conductive type of hearing loss is what we see. So what is it? what are the features we have already talked about? It. The patient is usually a female presenting uh, in the early 20s, uh, it starts slowly, the hearing loss doesn't just one day uh, one day come, you know, like a uh, uh, patient is fine, suddenly had a severe acute rhinitis or acute sinusitis and patient presented with hearing block the next day. That is also insidious onset, only it is not sudden onset like lightning, but this is more insidious. It happens over a period of years and it is painless. There is no reason why the patient will have pain, so it's painless. And the characteristic feature of photosclerosis it is progressive. This is very important. There are some features that we are going to come, come later, the differential diagnosis, which you have to differentiate it from otosclerosis. They are non-progressive, but the otosclerosis that we talk about, the otosclerosis is basically progressive. And both sides of the ear are affected, as we talked about in the previous presentation, bilateral conductive type of hearing loss. So I will repeat, the patient presents with conductive hearing loss involving both the ears, it's progressive, it is painless, insidious onset and the patient is a basically a female because the female to male ratio is 2 is to 1 present in the early 20s and this is what is called the presenting symptom. Patient is going to come to you with hard of hearing. Patient is not going to come to you and say I am having conductive hearing loss. Patient is going to say I am having hard of hearing. I am not able to hear well since so and so, since 3 years, since 2 years, it has aggravated during pregnancy. So this is why I want you to focus on this, the presenting feature, the most important feature, the most important symptom is hearing loss, hearing loss, hearing loss, conductive hearing loss. The other other symptoms that you are going to see in this patient, which are, which are not as important, right? you basically focus on the conductive hearing loss, right? The paracusis villicide, the other thing that you focus on the paracusis villicide. Paracusis villicide means the patient hears well in noisy surroundings. This is in exact contrast to uh, presbycusis where the patient is saying that I cannot hear when there is background noise. Only when it is like there is no background noise, it is relatively very calm and there is no noise, only then I can hear well. That is what the patient with presbycusis tells and presbycusis is sensory neural hearing loss. So this is conductive hearing loss. Now, why does paracusis villicide occur? Because the normal person will raise his voice in noisy surroundings. For a normal person, uh, when he is talking, what happens when there is a noisy surrounding? The ambient sound increases. He can't hear his ear own vo his own voice. He cannot hear properly. At that time, he raises his voice so that to make himself heard above the background noise. When he raises his voice to hear, make himself heard above the background noise. That is when that the voice will cross the hearing threshold of this otosclerotic patient who is having the hearing loss at around 30 decibels or 40 decibels, 30, 35, 40 decibels. He crosses the threshold of that patient and that makes the patient hear better in noisy surroundings, not because of the noise, but because the person uh, who is talking to raises his voice when there is 
noise when there is background noise or in noisy surroundings this will occur not only in otosclerosis but in any conductive hearing loss any conductive pathology the ear which is having conductive pathology uh, will present with it as long as as there is no sensory neural component once there is a sensory neural component you will see the picture of otosclerosis uh, patient cannot hear well in background noises patient also has this is a classic uh, presentation that patient comes and tells i put a hearing aid i hear well when i am at home but when i go to the market i cannot hear well that is because of fresh vacuosis right that is because of sensory neural hearing loss as long as there is no sensory neural component where the, the where the pathology is predominantly conductive you are going to have this paracusis villi that is hearing better in noisy surroundings okay what are the other things that you will see these things may or may not be there now that is what i want you to understand tinnitus vertigo will not be present in every case they may be present they may not be present the reason why it is put here is you should know that the patient with otosclerosis can have tinnitus the patient with otosclerosis can have vertigo it is not that the the patient will not have vertigo these are uncommon the tinnitus will be there only when there is some sensory neural deafness otherwise the tinnitus will not be there only when there is increased vascularity because of active lesion the patient will have tinnitus without uh, these two factor that is either sensory neural deafness or there is an active lesion patient is not going to have tinnitus so tinnitus is a rare finding do not expect it to be there in every case vertigo vertigo is also uncommon what what causes vertigo when there is some problem with the sensory apparatus with the macula or cupula of the semicircular canals or the uh, utricle and saccule you know because of that only the patient will have vertigo so you are not affecting that part of the ear but when the toxic metabolites from this otosclerotic focus go and affect the inner ear fluid only then you can have vertigo so vertigo is uncommon it is not present in every case but keep your mind open to the fact that vertigo can be present with otosclerosis speech speech is described as monotonous and well modulated why is it monotonous and well modulated because uh, a normal person has an ambient noise which is coming out wherever you are sitting in whichever calm silent surroundings you are sitting there is always an ambient noise if you if we put a person a normal hearing person in a in a in a room where it is sound proof right the patient uh, will hear tinnitus right that is something that even i have experienced when you sit in a uh, audiometry room okay so tinnitus is seen so in otosclerosis this ambient noise is gone why because there is conductive pathology the the not the, the and there is also low frequency hearing loss is also described so that that ambient noise is gone so the whatever the patient is speaking he is hearing it very clearly patient is hearing his own voice very clearly his own voice very clearly so his voice or his speech is monotonous and well modulated so let us just go through the various symptoms of otosclerosis the various symptoms of otosclerosis the first and the most important that we want everybody to focus on most common is the conductive hearing loss the, the patient is going to say i am having hearing loss okay patient is having i am having hearing loss patient will say i am i can hear better in uh, uh, noisy surroundings the patient can have tinnitus the patient can have vertigo but these are not the presenting features the patient this conductive hearing loss so the hearing loss can be associated with tinnitus can be associated with vertigo and the speech of the voice you know patient is talking very calmly in a very monotonous way because he is not having any disturbance from the ambient noise so the speech is well modulated so this is what is an important question and this is what is important from the clinical point of view so these five things are the symptoms with which the patient is going to present now signs is something that we elicit what are the signs you look at the tympanic membrane tympanic membrane is normal and mobile there is no pathology of the tympanic membrane so tympanic membrane appears normal and mobile it is described as mint condition like it is in perfect condition it appears as if it is very perfect so you will not be able to get any clue to the diagnosis from the tympanic membrane in 90% of the cases you will not be able to come to a diagnosis based on looking at the tympanic membrane in 90% of the cases in 10% of the cases though there is an active focus so there is an increased vascularity around the uh, uh, around the 
oval window region which causes you to have that blue reddish hue it is reddish hue seen on the promontory through the tympanic membrane at the posterior superior quadrant where there is the oval window that is called the schwartz sign or the flamingo pink sign so what is schwartz sign and flamingo pink sign in 10% of the cases which are active there is increased vascularity that appears at the posterior superior quadrant of the tympanic membrane that appears uh, uh, the posterior quadrant of the tympanic membrane has a reddish hue this is called uh, uh, schwartz sign or flamingo pink sign schwartz sign or flamingo pink sign is an important question from the neat point of view so you have to see when which condition does the patient have schwartz sign or flamingo pink sign that is otosclerosis active otosclerosis when you talk about schwartz sign it means that the lesion is active the, the newborn formation is actively being formed there is increased vascularity in this increased vascularity patient will have tinnitus also okay so uh, with this we complete the presentation of uh, this topic